welcome everyone this morning. Um, yeah, I, I just as we were worshiping this morning, um, it just came into my head. You know, sometimes it comes into my head like I was sharing a guy yesterday, a French guy. French are very artistic and very lovely people, you know. But actually, I was talking about God, and I said, you know, the scientists say that the Earth is so old and you know the Sun and so forth, millions and millions of years. And I said, I don't have a problem with that. I says, but uh, I actually prefer the Bible account of how things were made. That God just got an idea. And he just dreamed up the earth. And he just dreamed up the sun. He just says, try that with that there. See what that looks like. Take the moon and put it over there. See what that's like. Try a few rocks. Try some oceans. Try some fish. You know that God is a creator. And actually, that's one of the key things when we worship God. It's just something where you're struggling to worship God. When you see God as the creator, you know, even the angels, when they worship God, they say they worship him because he is the creator of the heavens and the earth. There's a guy who walked into the park yesterday and he had a big, big t-shirt and it was a big splash um, of, the, of the galaxies, you know, like a really cosmic t-shirt. He was a Swiss guy, and I got talking to him about the t-shirt and, you know, about God and whatever. And uh, he didn't quite get it, the God part, you know. But I, I was just trying to get him to think, like, a little bit outside the box as to how that all happened and whatever. And that's the God we come to. And I think maybe science, in, in a way, because it, it lays such f emphasis on the age and the ancient earth and whatever. And I'm not a scientist, I, I can't get into all the theological arguments. But I know God created the heavens and the earth. I just no, He did. And when we worship God, um, you know, that's just mind blowing, actually. If you think of all the time, they're still discovering species of insects and stuff. You, you just see the variety and this little dot called the earth, and then you try and get your head around the universe, you won't do it. It's just so, so unbelievably big. And I've listened to lots and lots of. People on videos and things trying to describe the dimensions of the universe, you just can't. You can't conceive it. That's God's power. And I think when we worship God, you know, we can't have a view of God sometimes that he's just, you know, to fit or to script or box. You know, but God is God. And it's something, something much bigger. And God has given us his word. You know, to faithful men that lived long ago, prophets and the apostles and and Jesus himself, of course, in the Son of God, who gave us words from God. Jesus said when he speaks, it's the Father speaking true. He says, I don't say anything except what I hear the Father telling me to say. Jesus and the Father being one, God speaking through his Son, that's when he thought he was a prophet, and God speaking through the prophets of old, and today God does speak to us by His Spirit, again, both through the Scriptures in various ways, you know, as they're expounded on, as we read them ourselves, and um, sometimes through the prophetic. You may have a prophet come by and he may speak a prophecy into your life. And sometimes we have to wait because we're flawed, you know, sometimes we get it right, sometimes we get it wrong, but it has all things weighed up. But God is speaking all the time, all the time, continuously. But God doesn't sleep. It's actually one thing, we're not like God in. God never sleeps. He just doesn't. I don't think he's up the truck down somewhere. But he doesn't sleep. And because God is spirit, he's not subject to the restraints that we're subject to in the laws that we are born into this, in this world, which places a lot of restrictions on us in terms of what we'd like to be and what we'd like to become. Last week, we were looking at Romans 8, verses 1 to... Seven, and this is um, this passage one to sixteen is known as the um, uh, the normal Christian life. So when we look, if you're looking for a picture of the normal Christian life, it's Romans eight verses one to actually probably yeah one to sixteen. One to sixteen is probably or one to seventeen is a fairly good script on it, and so. When I look at passages of scripture, I suppose it's just the way I am, I, I like to sort of um, question everything I read 
question words, question, you know, what I perceive something to mean, and then look at it more closely and say, am I actually, you know, misunderstanding? So anyone who wasn't here last week, uh, my good friend Julius has uh, recorded the message, and where do you post it? Where do you post, uh, where do you put up the um, preaching? I, I only share. Share? Yeah, share. Maybe it's most bloody, so I feel it. Ah, yeah, Spirit and Truth. Uh, yeah, yeah, he shares that on Spirit and Truth group, Messenger group, is it? The group chat. Huh? Yeah, the group chat that we have. The messenger. Yeah, group chat, Messenger, uh, Spirit and Truth have a group chat, Messenger. Mm -hmm. And you can get the sermons there if, um, if, if it's something you want, want to do. So we'll move on from where we were last week. Um, Actually, I didn't get to verse 8, but we'll skip on anyway to verse 9. Now this, uh, just to paint the picture with the scripture, these scriptures are speaking to believers. Okay, if, this, if you don't know the Lord, this can be all very confusing. And it can actually sound like um, foolishness, really. But if you know the Lord, it's important to um, believe. You know when we come to believe Christ as Lord and He's risen from the dead? What happens is during Christian life, there's so much more truth than Jesus' resurrection. So much more truth. And as we go through the scriptures, there's truth, truth, truth. And actually, the more truth that you actually believe, the more um, fruitful and productive your service for God is. Because if you start not believing certain things, you know, the Bible says some amazing things about us. Some amazing things. But there's times when we would think, ah, I don't think that's true. But the more truth you actually believe in Scripture, the more you um, prosper in your Christian walk, and actually the more it has a benefit for others as well as yourself. Because it's all truth. That's the spirit of truth, the sin to guide us into all truth. That's why Jesus said he'd ask the Father for the Spirit of Truth. And he said to the believers, He's your men of truth, his heart's on the side of truth, so it's better for you that I go away and I go away and ask the Father, give you the Spirit of Truth, and the Spirit of Truth will guide you into all truth. Not like 60% of truth, but all truth. And that's why it's really important to believe the Word of God, truth. To really believe truth, all truth. You know, are you conscious that you are a child of God? Are you conscious that you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? Do you know that God delights in you? Do you know that He rejoices over you with sin? Or do you think, oh, I've had a bad day, or I've had God or something, and He doesn't feel like that anymore? You know, we have to get a right view of God, otherwise we'll, um, we'll beat ourselves up pretty bad. He says in this verse 9, But you are not in the flesh. This is speaking of those of us in Christ but in the Spirit. And this little word means so much, the if, if, ifs of the Bible. We see lots of ifs, 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 ifs. And, you know, because it's, it's when you hear that word if, it's like then there's a, um, you have to ask yourself a question, you know, am I in the Spirit, or am I not in the Spirit? If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he's not his. And before you go to the next one, um, a big deception, unfortunately true, how Christian Dom, if I call it that, Christian Dom or Christian D, is that people, um, like when we went to Joyce's graduation in the school, I was sitting in the classroom, which is about this size, and they had all the fruits of the Holy Spirit all written on the wall. They had a little ceremony thing where everyone lit a candle and uh, they talked about like one for kindness, one for joy. And it was like, I don't, and they're talking all about the Spirit of God. I said, the bread of the way home. Even the classroom's covered with stuff. And I said, but the strange thing is they don't have the Spirit of God. And the, the, that's the deception that sometimes can happen where a person may believe they have the Spirit of God because they're surrounded with all this maybe and believe in some way they have it but they're just not, you know, putting it into practice or something. 
And then there's those who have the Spirit of God. I know when I received the Spirit of God, it was Tuesday morning, June Bank Holiday, 1990, and I knew I didn't have the Spirit of God after I received it, because it was completely different to what I um, ever thought about that, that subject. But yeah, to those who have the Spirit of God, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, it says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God? And that the Spirit of God dwells in you. So do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Now a temple is like a tabernacle. It's like a place where God lives. You know, we often think of temples we see in the Far East and you know, these Buddhist monasteries and various things. But the scripture says this, and do you believe this true? Because the scripture says it's true, that you are the temple. You are that temple. Wherever you go, you carry the presence of God. Wherever God sends you, wherever, if you're on the hospital ward, if you're in the classroom, if you're down the wall, down in the sewers like I go down, <laughs> wherever you go, you are carrying the presence of God. Because you are a temple of God. And the Spirit of God dwells in you. In other words, the Spirit of God has found a place to live within you. The Spirit of God has made a home within you. So you're the home of God. You're God's home. The scripture says that God lives in a high and holy place called heaven. A high and lofty place called heaven. But also in people who are meek, humble of heart, and tremble at his word. And that's just my blood. The God who dreamed up the universe came into your life and now dwells within you. That same Spirit of God, because by the Son and the Holy Spirit, a Spirit dwells within you. You are a tabernacle of God. And um, that scripture is very much emphasized in the New Testament. It's in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you're not even your own? You don't belong to yourself. <laughs> you belong to somebody else. You're not even your own. That's, just, that's an, a staggering thing. You know, in, in a life where the modern world, where everyone's so independent, and they want their rights, and want their this, and want their that. You know, and people strike for more money, and protest for things, and whatever. But when you're a believer, you're not your own. You have actually surrendered your rights over yourself. You actually belong to God. You're his possession. He owns you. I have no problem with that personally. <laughs> because before I knew the Lord, I had not got a clue. That's all I can say. But he owns you. He has rights over you. It's like a slave to a master, like in olden times, a slave would do whatever the master did and was without any question. That's, that's not what it is. We are, if you like, we're just what the scripture says that God owns us. In 2 uh, Corinthians 6.16 it says, For we are the temple of the living God. 2 Timothy 1.14 says, uh, says, Through the Holy Spirit who dwells in you, and John 14, 23 says that Jesus was speaking these words. He says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our abode in him. Sometimes we think of God, you know, as God the Father and Jesus are up in heaven. And the Holy Spirit is in us, the Trinity. But Jesus said that God the Father and Jesus will live in us. Because we sometimes, what we, what we do with our natural mind, we, we, um, we separate things out. We put the Father is here, Jesus is here, and the Holy Spirit is here. But actually, as Jesus said, me and my Father are one. And the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, is one with God. So it's, 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 it's something that's, you kind of, you have to get really by revelation. That... Even though the Father is present in heaven and Jesus is present in heaven, heaven is present in you. Because the Word of God says that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. So heaven is in you. And when heaven is in you, 
by the Spirit of God, then God is in you, God the Father is in you, and Jesus is in you. Even though God the Father is, is, is dwelling in heaven, because His Spirit is within you, He's within you because God is Spirit. It's not like, you, because you see, in the natural order of things, if you take three people, and you put them there and you say, well that person's there, that person's there, and that person's there. So, there's one person there. But with God, it's not the same. The Holy Spirit is there, so too are the Father and Jesus. The Father is there, so too is Jesus and the Father. If you know what I'm saying, it's the Spirit of God. The very Spirit of God dwells within us. The Father of the universe. The Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows from whom every good and perfect gift comes dwells in you. Dwells in you. My goodness. Like, when, you, when you start to get it, like, it, it should be like kind of a light bulb thing, but that's what Jesus promised. And even if we can't fully conceptualize what that actually is, how to, how to conceptualize that is the truth. Because Jesus never told a lie. Jesus said, I call and make my home. He said, me and my father will make my home. And he said, the spirit of truth will be me. Just the spirit of God. And of course, when Jesus is saying that, he's not talking about being bodily present with us. He's talking about his spirit. It's like your spirit. If your spirit could go into Kyle, and then Kyle would know all your thoughts. Okay? And your spirit and his spirit were one. It's like you've been synced up like that. So the spirit of God, well, in the world, you're getting God's thoughts. You're getting the thoughts of the Father. You're getting the thoughts of Jesus. And you're getting communication from the Father and from Jesus. Galatians 4.6 says, God has sent forth the spirit of his Son into our hearts. There's always these kind of distinctions when you read them along the Bible. You say, well, it's the spirit of his Son. It's the spirit of Jesus. But it's also the spirit of the Father. It's the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. And in 1 John 4, 13, it says, By this we know we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us of His Holy Spirit. This is how we know we're children of God. How we abide in Him because He has given us of His Holy Spirit. That's really, really precious. Never underestimate the Holy Spirit. Never take the presence of God in your life lightly. Like that is, you know, that is just so, so precious. In Romans chapter 8 verse 10, it goes on to say, And if Christ is in you, Christ is in you, the body, that's your physical body, is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. This is when it says, yeah, that's a New King James translation. Christ is in you. The body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. And this idea that our body is dead. We, we, we don't really think our body is dead because you go to the graveyard and his body is dead. <laughs> that person's body is dead. But that's the truth. I, I actually think that's... If you get that, actually, you know a lot of the struggles with sin and the issues that we have as Christians, you know, maybe struggling with, with victory over sin in areas of our life. But do we really consider our body is dead? Actually, Romans, I think chapter 6 says, the word reckon means that you, the calculation, it's, it's a word I think from, from a... Um, an accountancy term, but you you kind of analyze and then you decide that you're dead to sin. Because your body is dead. In Romans, uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, it says, uh, Paul obviously understood this very well. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. There's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I have been crucified with Christ. We, because we identify with Christ and we're the body of Christ, we were crucified with Christ. 
This old nature, the sinful nature, the flesh, if you like, the body of sinful death, that nature was actually crucified in Christ. That aspect of us actually, actually was consumed through the crucifixion. And I suppose the dilemma is that it's with us still, so how can it be dead? You know? It's dead, the scripture says, because of sin. In other words, this body, the scripture says that flesh and blood does not inherit eternal life. So this body, which is dead, is assigned to destruction, if you like, for God to recreate us fresh and anew. But I think the important thing from this scripture is to believe that your body is dead to sin. It's a spiritual reality. It's not obviously physically you're, you're alive, but your body is dead because of sin. In other words, this physical body that we possess will not possess eternal life. It does not belong to the spiritual realm. I suppose it's the best way to put it to you. Um, if you go back to that scripture again, Colossians 1, sorry, 120, yeah, just leave that one. The body is dead because of sin. Colossians 1, 27 says, Christ is in you the hope of glory. And Romans 6, verses 2 to 7, it says, Verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue, continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live in it any longer? Shall I write that one? How can we who died to sin live in it any longer? If you really believe that you're dead to sin, if you really, really believe it, that you are dead to sin, sin no longer has dominion, then you won't be inclined to sin. Does that really make sense? If you actually fully believe, if you believe you're a child of God, it affects you in a positive way. But if you believe you're dead to sin, you won't be inclined to sin. Because it would become something abnormal for you. If you know what I'm trying to say. It would be an abnormal thing for you. Because you, you, you would have to, you would like... Because sometimes people just don't believe these things, that you're actually dead to sin. But that's what the scripture says. It goes on in verse 11, Romans 6, verse 11. Likewise, Romans 8, sorry, verse 11. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves... Sorry, I'm on the... I'm on the, I'm on the but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies... Through his spirit who dwells in you. See, a mortal body is what we possess. And a mortal body is exactly that, it's mortal. Mortal means that it is not immortal. In other words, it, can, it is not, it is something that ceases to exist at a certain point. Your body ceases to exist at a certain point. And there's a, a connection, a really a running, a thread running right through these scriptures of. The relationship between the human body and the power of sin over the human body and the debt to the human body, but ultimately where God comes and then recreates the body into an immortal body. He says, but if the spirit of him who dwells in you, who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead, so the if is that the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. That's the Holy Spirit. He who raised Christ from the dead, that's God the Father, will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit. That's God's spirit who dwells in you. So it's by the spirit that's within you that God will give life to your mortal body. It's by the spirit of God that dwells in you. God will give life to your mortal body. So I just take from that that when God does give us resurrection life, that we will look like we look like to some degree. You know, that we won't be all um, eater, if you like. It goes on in, in 
in verse 11 also it said in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 42 so also is the resurrection of the dead the body is sown in corruption this is our body it is raised in incorruption incorruption is something that can't be corrupted no steel can be corrupted by rust it is sown in dishonor obviously when you're dead you put into a box you're brought to a graveyard it's not actually you know, it's not actually something that's very honorable really I suppose it is raised in glory so here it is this weak frame is put into the grave but it is raised in glory Jesus spoke about the, the glory of the, the body when it's raised you know that we would be like like angelic bodies it is sown in weakness sickness gets a hold of people so people die because of sickness and whatever and so it's sown in weakness but it is raised in power spiritual power it is raised in power it is sown a natural body and this is really key it is raised a spiritual body so even though we die a natural death we are raised not like a natural body but we are raised a spiritual body there's life given to us and we are then raised a spiritual body there's a lot of questions around that coming into my head i just but i, but I just point out what the scripture says there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. 44. And then it goes on to say in verse 53, for this corruptible, this is corruptible, must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible body has put on incorruption, and this mortal body has put on immortality. Then shall be brought the pass, the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. For death, where is your sting? Here is, where is your victory? This is the real hope, you know, for a Christ, for, for the Christian. This is what, like, takes the, 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 um, the utter grief out of death. If anyone's ever buried a loved one and how people react, you know, when someone dies. Because there is this state of finito, gone. And it's trying to put the person's trying to cope with that and understand it and deal with it. But for us who believe in Christ at the resurrection of the dead, that saying, where are death is your sting, oh here it is where is your victory. I don't know where that where that was written in the Old Testament, I couldn't find it, but but it was obviously there somewhere in, in some of the ancient scriptures. But the point is very simple. Hades, which is the, you know, the general lord of the, the dead, it no longer rules. You know, that really is the real, real big thing for hanging on to Jesus. Really hanging on to him, because death and the grave you know, that swallow up, you know, people if you like. That has no power to hold you. Absolutely no power to hold you. Because God did not in you. But as we said, because God owns us, like last week we were talking, it says that we have an obligation to God. We actually do have obligations to certain people. We have an obligation to God. It says, but it's not to the sinful nature, which is dead anyway, but you can still use it. It's not to the sinful nature to live according to it. Our obligation is to God. Really, our obligation really is to develop that deep, intimate, personal relationship with God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit within us, by His Spirit. And... To respond accordingly. There's a lady one time I heard at a conference. She said the fruitfulness of a Christian, she said, is it directly dependent on the degree of intimacy that that person has developed with God? Amen. And that intimacy is developed in your private capacity. It's where you go personally, where you decide, 
And I'm not going to watch the Harley game today, or whatever, the basketball, whatever you do. But I'm just going into my prayer closet for an hour or two to seek God. Seek you with all your heart. Seek God with all your heart. Seek Him. Really, I just emphasize this. I just seek God. Seek Him with all your heart. We go on seeking God that we know, but there's so much more to know. Seek God. Take two hours. Go into your prayer closet. Even if it's hard at the beginning, just worship them. Worship them. Pray in the spirit if you have a spiritual language, but worship them. Worship them. Begin pouring your heart out to God. Begin opening your heart to God. Begin telling Him your fears. Begin telling Him your disappointments. Begin telling Him your troubles. Begin telling Him your desires. And start to lay hold of God. Start to call on Him to fulfill things in your life. That you might accomplish something that matters. Not something that matters to someone where the only thing that matters is the bottom line figure at the end of the week. But something that matters to God for eternity. I'm working away from home at the moment, so I'm staying away. And when you're, anyone stays in another house, it's, you, can, you know, you can't be yourself, you can't do the things you're doing and whatever. So what I've been doing is I get up in the morning, I stay in a little village called Dalleha. It's a funny name. Um, so I get up in the morning and the landlady is, where were you? You're gone at 7 o'clock. You know, I have a up or anything. But I go down, to just this beautiful scenery all around there. I just go down and park up the car. And looking at the ocean and spend some time in the Word and pray and worship God. And you know the funny thing is when you do it, the day even goes better. Like the guy, the guy that I'm working with, he came back in that evening and he was saying it was a really productive day, we got locked on today and, and so on. But he didn't know that I'd been praying. And when you pray, just you get favor and little keys and little things open up for you. So you, you just even in natural work. But this is something that's really key. We have to go, we have to decide what's our priority. Is God our priority? And if you are we prepared to spend time seeking Him. Verse 12 and 13. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors. How do you ever owe money? How do you ever have a mortgage or anything? It's not nice being a debtor. Stay away from the, stay away from the loan sharks, anyway. Definitely not for us to be debtors to those guys. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. But notice that scripture says that we are debtors. And what that means is that we all God. That we owe. But we're not debtors to the sinful nature. We don't owe the sinful nature anything. The sinful nature is dead. We do not have to obey it. But when it uses that term a debtor, in other words, that person has to obey. The money, the money lent the comes. Where's the money? You're looking for the money and you're trying to give them something because you owe it. So you're, if you like it, you have you're kind of caught and trapped in a way. And <coughs> The human nature, we're not a debtor to that nature anymore, but we are a debtor not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if, all these ifs appear so many times, by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Notice there that the key thing in being an overcoming Christian, aside from believing truth, is that you cooperate with the Spirit of God within you. That's the key thing. I mean, if you're willing to yield to the Spirit of God within you, even on the most minor things and develop a sensitivity to the Spirit of God, it's amazing that when you yield to the Spirit of God, then the trap that was set for you, or the, you know, the craving of the flesh, whatever it is, it doesn't it doesn't like um, it doesn't get a hold of you, see. But if you don't yield to the spirit of God within you, then you will find yourself plunging back into the flesh. It's a choice. But it's important that we hold God in the right regard. And when we receive a prompt from the Holy Spirit, 
um, just that influence of the Holy Spirit. God doesn't come down commanding things to us, but He is this gentle, very ever so tender, gentle unction within us. That's His command to you. That's not the words, but that's His command to you. That unction within you is His command to you. And we do well to heed that unction. And I, I say that just having years of I'm actually preaching to myself really on that one. And Colossians 3 5 says, Consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Colossians 3 5. Therefore, put to death, says your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. <coughs> yeah, it depends on which translation. I actually prefer this one to consider your members of your body as dead to the various corruptions described there. But would you consider they're dead? They're dead. But they're dead anyway. Mm -hmm. But you might consider they're dead, if you know what I'm saying. And so you might be kind of like yielding to your members. But when you actually really get that, that actually you are dead to sin. You don't have to yield to what we yielded to before in your lives. You're not under any obligation to it. You're not a debtor, as the scripture says, to that nature. In verse 14, Romans 8, it says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Now that word sons is one of those generic terms in Luke's daughters. Possibly for anyone who might think it's a little bit uh, unfair, you, you could substitute the word as children of God. And it does that in some places in the scripture. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. There's a lot of talk when I listen, when I'm just chatting to people, like the Swiss guy I, I, I talked to yesterday, there's a belief out there that everybody has this like uh, common God likeness. You know, that's common to everybody. That we all have this sort of, you know, all kind of religions are kind of basically it's the same God, but people are interpreting it in all different ways. And, is this kind of common humanity. But we are not all children of God. And the scripture tells us who are the children of God. And I just, I just bring out a few scriptures on this. The first thing, as many as are led by the Spirit of God. And to be led by the Spirit of God is to be led. When you're a small child, your mommy takes you by the hand and she leads you where she wants you to go. You don't have any choice, but it's clear unless you can cry pretty bad. But you, your mommy leads you where you want to go. The Spirit of God, in like manner, leads you where He wants you to go. I know that when I go out to evangelize, I know that very much. The Spirit of God will lead me, literally lead me to where the exact place it should be. And then a person I'm meant to meet will turn up there. So I know it in that context very well. But there's also the leading of the Holy Spirit to do things. And Bless others, help others in the leading of the Holy Spirit in our relationships and with people and so on. It's a constant thing. But as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. The sons of God. And it's, the quote is also in Romans 9, verse 26, taken directly from Hosea. It says in verse 26, I will... And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people. There you shall be called sons of the living God. This was a scripture that was speaking about the return of the Jewish people back to, um, back to Israel. And they become known as the sons of God. Matthew chapter 5 verse 9 um, refers to us as being the sons of God. And one that I find very interesting is John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. 
Mark is pretty good at this actually. But as many, it says about Jesus, Jesus came to his own, but his own received them not. That means he came to the Jewish people who were the children of God by, by calling, at least. But as many as received him, as Christ, to them, he gave them the right. Not everybody has the right. You have to receive Christ. To become children of God. To those who believe in his name. Who were born not of blood. Nor of the will of flesh. Nor of the will of man. But born of God. So what's the second condition to being a child of God? You must accept Christ. Personally. You must accept Christ. And you must be born again. You must be born of God. And that's the second um, aspect of, being, of, of the definition of being a child of God. There's lots of these, but I, I don't go... Just for those who are taking notes, 2 Corinthians 6... 16 to 18 and Galatians 3 uh, verse 26. Here's one, 1 John 3 verse 1. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God and such we are. It's all over the place in the scripture for those who have accepted Christ and those who have loved them. In Revelations 21 verse 7 looks at the future aspect of being a child of God. And he says, he who overcomes shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he will be my son. You know, we've overcome by faith but overcoming is a continuous process. He who does my will to the end, the scripture talks about. Overcoming is a daily process as well. It's something we have to do every day by the spirit of the dead and the states of body. In the, going back to Romans 8, verse 15, it says, For you, that's us, did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. Remember, for those who don't have Christ, the Bible says the whole world is laid captive by the evil one through fear of death. Fear of death is something that is common to all unsaved humanity. And it's actually the devil works through fear. Just to say that, the devil really wants to fear. The Bible says, do not fear a man, this is a trap. The Bible uses this thing called fear, and wicked people often try and put fear on other people to control them. But the devil works through fear. But you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. You know this anxiety thing, this fear thing, <coughs> the bondage of people. So <coughs> You know, like, oh, what happen if, what happen if, I can't do. But you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit, this is talking about the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of Jesus, the spirit of the Father. You have received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Now this word, Abba, is not just, Mamma Mia, did you hear about that? <laughs> uh, uh, no? Do you remember the song? That's <laughs> when I read that, that's why I thought Abba. I said, what's Abba doing in the Bible? You know? um, actually, I, I looked it up yesterday, and the commentaries I was reading were saying it's not actually a, a Hebrew word, but it's actually an, uh, an Arabic word for father. So, when I was witnessing yesterday, I met this man that I was talking to him and his wife, and they were Arabs. And I asked them, I said, what does this word Abba mean? They said, we don't know. We don't have that word. And I said, I was reading and I told them whatever. Well, this is in, in the Arabic language, Ab means father. That part, Ab. In their language, so they, they would say father, they say Ab. And he said, also, we can say uh, Baba, like Bab. And he said, Bab is like saying dad. You know, here you'd say dad or daddy. They'd say Bab for dad. And they say Ab for father. So I'm not actually sure what that is yet. I mean, exactly. But what it, it's, it's like, to me, the best way I can 
kind of explain it. It's like it's like an emphasizing of father. You know, it's like another word. To, so you, you could say like daddy, father, or so you know, so, you know, a word that another word emphasizes it. So that's what I would say. That's because it's obviously a different language. It's not Arabic, according to what, but it has an Arabic. That's Arabic. Um, and uh, so I'm not sure how it actually, how the translators got it from Arabic into the Greek and then eventually into English. I don't know, you know, what happened to it along the way. But it's another word of saying, let me just put it this way. Some translations say God the Father. Some say actually Daddy Father. But it's a, it's, it's a way of saying Father and Mother. That's the best way I can put it to you. We have receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out Father. Remember Jesus was heard. He made intercession with loud cries and tears. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. We actually do need to cry out to God. If that's something you know you've done in the past because you know you, you came to the end and you cried out to God. No, we actually need cry out to God more than we actually think we need to cry out to God. Just because things get kind of maybe cozy and, and, and comfortable for a season in our life. No. God has a purpose in, in our calling and election. And it's by the spirit of adoption that we cry out Abba, Father. That spirit of life that's within us that causes us to groan and travail, you know, with groans that words cannot express, the scripture says. So sometimes when you get really close to God, it gets really weird. And it gets really painful. When you get close to God, it's like the spirit within you begins to, you can get close, you can start experiencing the pain of God, the burden of God, and, you know, the longing of God for humanity. But you know, the intercessors who go there in God, they bear great fruit through those prayers. And through that, you know, praying out to God. I remember one time, God had uh, given me a revelation to make a trip. And uh, I, he gave me a mission. He actually told me, the Spirit of God told me which mission organization to go through. And, and I took Brain now, we went to their mission organization here in Ireland. We, we did an interview. Um, it didn't seem to, the fact that we were from a charismatic church didn't seem to be that particularly attractive to them, but anyway. And uh, so I was to and fro, and they gave me the contact in Russia, they gave me the mission base, and I was sending over emails and whatever. And I was kind of, you know when someone's not telling you no and not telling you yes? You ever had that? Like, and you're kind of like, am I or am I not? So I eventually just put it to the person uh, who, was, who would have had to initiate like the procedure on the other side, this is what I am, this is what I do, is that a problem? And uh, they said, yeah, it would be a problem for us, because they were working with Conservative Baptist Church, and they talk, you know, the two things would clash. And so basically the door closed, and I talked, God, I went down the garden, went into the tunnel, and I had really set my heart on this, because you know when it comes from God, you live. And I cried out to God, I mean it properly, you know, big time. And then you could hear me, it was my next door neighbor, he was around, or, or the flowers, or whatever was growing there. And I cried out to God. I really did. I just, it just something wrenched inside me. And I cried out to God, like, in a way, it's hard to do. I mean, it, it, the spirit does it. And when I went back up the garden, and I had a little memory stick at the time, we didn't have the internet, it wasn't so advanced. But um, I put on the phone, or I put on the internet. And um, every email is sitting there in an hour, you know, the old way of you know, And I put it on. And there's this guy, I didn't know who he was, Gary Parkinson was his name, um, an Australian guy. And he sent me an email, and he said, um, he said, I got your email from you, and I'm interested in talking to you. He rang us that night, and he was a truck driver from Australia, and he was doing a mission out in Russia. And I hadn't really taken him seriously because it wasn't what God had shown him. But I got us out there. And we spent three months and we got to go all kinds of places and do all kinds of ministry and all kinds of things. But there's a time when we have to battle. You know, the enemy or certain things can even go against the will of God. You know, even, even churches could be, could be going 
you know, against what God wants to actually happen in some instances because we're going by their mind. But when God speaks, it will happen because God doesn't lie. But you do at times have to go and fight the battle. It's like someone taking your inheritance, you know, and people having to go and fight for their inheritance. You know, in real life, you know, things like that do happen. But certain things we have to fight for. The things that God particularly has called us to do in life and to accomplish in life, we do have to fight for it. We do have to battle. We have to actually lay hold of God for these things so that we can see them accomplished. And of course, we went there, we had plenty of challenges along the way. And verse 16 to finish on this verse, it says, The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Just a point to make there, you have not lost your spirit if you are a child of God. You have a relationship between, with God via the Spirit of God. No, via your spirit from the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God communicates to your spirit. That's why you have to be able to detect your spirit. So the Spirit of God communicates to your spirit. You detect it in your spirit. And then you process it with your mind. If you like. The revelation of your spirit. But it's with your spirit to spirit. That's what the relationship with God is all about. It's a spirit to spirit. What my niece said one time about preaching and teaching and so forth. He said, the only true ministry in the church is spirit to spirit. It's not really so much explained in scriptures, but it's when the spirit of God illuminates that to you or connects you. The way we talk, it connects with you. That's when it's real ministry. Because it connects with your spirit. And when it connects with your spirit, it has power to fortify your spirit and strengthen your spirit. The spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The Holy Spirit inside you shall give you some kind of mm, that you are a child of God. It should just, it's like an inner knowing. Yeah, you just know because it's the Spirit that you just actually we don't just know, we know because the Spirit of God is bearing witness with us that we are we are children of God.